shouldn't be with yeah. We took nothing with us when we thought we would have to see. So there was much excitement as we packed our baskets. My uncle strode up and down outside the houses, urging us to hurry. The wind grows strong, he shouted. The ship will leave you. I filled two baskets with the things I wished to take. Three fine needles of whalebone, an awl for making holes, a good stone knife for scraping hides, two cooking pots and a small box made from a shell with my earrings in it. Ulape had two boxes of earrings, for she was vainer than I, and when she put them into her baskets, she drew a thin mark with blue prey across her nose and cheekbones. The mark meant that she was unmarried. The ship leaves, shouted Nanko. If it goes, Ulape shouted back, it will come again after the storm. My sister was in love with Nanko, but she laughed at him. Other men will come to the island, she said. They will be far more handsome and brave than those who leave. You are all women of such ugliness that they will be afraid and soon go away. The wind blew in fierce gusts as we left the village, stinging our faces with sand. Ramon hopped along far in front of with one of our baskets, but before long he ran back to say that he had forgotten his fishing spear. Nanko was standing on the cliff motioning us to hurry, so I refused to let him go for it. The ship was anchored outside the cove and Nanko said that it could not come closer to the shore because of the highway. They were beating against the rocks with the sound of thunder. The shore, as far as I could see, was rimmed with foam. Two boats were pulled up on the beach. Beside them stood four white men, and as we came down the trail, one of the men beckoned us to walk faster. He spoke to us in a language which we could not understand. The men of our tribe, except Nanko and Chief Matasai, were already on the ship. My brother Ramo was there too, Nanko said. He had run on ahead after I had told him that he could not go back to the village for his spear. Nanko said that he had jumped into the first boat that left the cove. Matasai divided the woman into two groups. Then the boats were pushed into the water, and while they bobbed about, we scrambled into them as best as we could. The cove was partly sheltered from the wind, but as soon as we went through the passage between the two rocks and into the sea, great waves struck. There was much confusion. Spray hue. The white men shouted at each other. The boat pitched so widely that in one breath you could see the ship and in the next breath it had gone. Yet we came to it at last and somehow were able to climb up on the deck. The ship was large, many times the size of our biggest canoes. It had two tall masts and between them stood a young man with blue eyes and a black beard. He was the chieftain of the white men, for he began to shout orders, which they quickly obeyed. Sails rose on the tall masts, and two of the men began to pull on the rope that held the anchor. I called to my brother, knowing that he was very curious and therefore would be in the way of the men who were working. The wind drowned my voice, and he did not answer. The deck was so crowded that it was hard to move, but I went from one end of it to the other. There was no thing. answer. No one had seen him. At last I found Nanko. I was overcome with fear. Where is my brother? I cried. He repeated what he had told me on the beach, but as he spoke, Ulape, who stood beside him, pointed towards the island. I looked out across the deck and the sea. There, running along the cliff, the fishing spear held over his head, was Ramu. The sails had filled and the ship was now moving slowly away. Everyone was looking towards the cliff, even the white men. I ran to one of them and pointed, but he shook his head and turned from me. The ship began to move faster. Against my will, I screamed. Chief Matasaib grasped my arm. We cannot wait for Ramo, he said. If we do, the ship will be driven on the rocks. We must, I shouted. We must. The ship will come back for him another day, Matasaib said. He will be safe. There is food for him to eat and water to drink and places to sleep. No, I cried. Matasaib's face was like stone. He was not listening. I cried out once more. But my voice was lost in the howling wind. People gathered around me, saying again what Matasaib had said. Yet I was not comforted by their words. Ramo had disappeared from the cliff, and I knew that he was now running along the trail that led to the beach. The ship began to circle the kelp bed, and I thought surely that it was going to return to the shore. I held my breath, 
waiting, then slowly its direction changed. It pointed towards the east. At that moment, I walked across the deck and, though many hands tried to hold me back, flung myself into the sea. A wave passed over my head and I went down and down until I thought I would never behold the day again. The ship was far away when I rose. Only the sail showed through the spray. I was still clutching the basket that held all of my things, but it was very heavy and I realized that I could not swim with it in my arms, letting it sink. I started off towards the shore. I could barely see the two rocks that guarded the entrance to Coral Cove, but I was not fearful. Many times I had swam farther than this, although not in a storm. I kept thinking over and over as I swam how I would punish Ramo when I reached the shore. Yet when I felt the sand under my feet and saw him standing at the edge of the waves, holding his fishing spear and looking so forlorn, I forgot all those things I had planned to do. Instead, I fell to my knees and put my arms around him. The ship had disappeared. When will it come back? Remo asked. There were tears in his eyes. Soon, I said. The only thing that made me angry was that my beautiful skirt of yucca fibers, which I had worked on so long and carefully, was now ruined. I'm just a loser. Shouldn't be with you.